Hello, welcome back. Gonna start reading True, sort of. This is chapter 18. That's how she woke up, too. She brushed her teeth counting, trudged downstairs counting, crunched her cereal counting. She counted as Galveston growled at her. I heard about you. You better shape up. 567, 568, 569. Her mouth mumbled while her fingers curled into fists. Galveston, Clarice called, get over here, and pulled her from the table so the numbers were not truly tested. She counted herself on the way to school. What are you doing? Arby asked her. She didn't stop. You're counting, he cheered. Then he sang it. You're counting, you're counting! Is it working? He wondered. She shrugged. It's working! You can stay, you can stay! He ran around her singing that. And Deli didn't tell him, don't count on it, because it was good to see somebody happy, even if it wasn't her. Lionel Tur Terwilliger had to ask her every question twice, once for her to quit counting and again for her to hear it. Then, for one sweet moment, there was no numbers. But as soon as she answered, a spider is an anthropod, not an anthropologist, she'd start again. It was the most boring morning ever, and when Deli imagined a lifetime of counting, it was like living death. I can't, she rasped, till she remembered Clarice. 4,732, 4,733, she kept on. At recess, she took herself to Alaska. What the glove am I going to look at? She asked the state of seclusion. Because Deli had done some thinking. There were two ways, she decided, she kept ending up in trouble town. One was thinking something would be fun and doing it. The other was fighting. She wasn't sure the counting could keep her away from either of them. So she scanned the playground, searching for something that wouldn't tempt her with fun or the fight. There was Danny Novello on the basketball court. Just make me mad, she muttered. Gwenny and Tater were racing. Too glad. Everywhere, kids were playing and shouting. Too ball gram fun, she rasped. And then she saw it, sitting under a tree, bent over a book. Was that Ferris Boyd? It wasn't fun, and it didn't make her want to fight much. What? she began. From 1 to 1,129, she watched the girl turn the page twice. Like watching ice melt, she mumbled. At 1,130, some birds flitted by Ferris Boyd. Squirrels ran circles around her. Deli yawned. At 1,492, a bird landed on Ferris Boyd's head. It put its beak in her hair. Deli sat up. The bird flapped down on Ferris Boyd's shoulder and hopped along her arm like it was a branch. It perched on her hand. Huh? Deli quit counting. Ferris Boyd looked up from her book. Then the girl and the bird stared at each other as if they were having a conversation, without making a sound. When they were finished, the bird flew off. The girl went back to reading. What's going on over there? Deli rasped. The bell rang and Ferris Boyd stood. The creatures disappeared into the air and across the grass. Chisel, Deli heard herself sigh. Like she was sorry it was over. Like it was fun. That wasn't fun, she scolded herself. It was like watching paint dry. And she followed everybody in the school. Sitting at her desk, though, she kept thinking about Ferris Boyd and that bird telling each other things without talking. 1,556, 1,557, she murmured. Hmm. The day went downhill from there. During social studies, the digits dulled her to sleep. Lionel Terwilliger Tur had to shake her. One, two, three, she woke up shouting, till she heard the laughs all around her. Ball gram counting, she muttered. But when Novello passed her desk and hissed, Hey, Smelly, she snarled. 858, 859, instead of slugging him. Mr. Novello, Lionel, Lionel Terwilliger boomed. You will write Miss Pattinson's name is Delaware 100 times. So the numbers were good for something. She was counting when R.B. came to her room before dinner. Hey, he said. She nodded. You get in trouble today, he whispered. She shook her head. He started singing. No trouble today. Between 12,345 and 12,346, she told him. It's like eating cardboard, R.B. It's killing me. You can do it, he reassured her. 
Chapter 19 But Delhi was drowning in the dullness. Every day was nothing but numbers, the same ones over and over again. She stopped feeling sunshine. The world turned dingy gray. Except at recess. The creatures came as soon as Ferris Boyd sat down. Red and blue and yellow birds danced in the air above her. Squirrels played tag beside her. Sometimes Deli would catch herself giggling and saying, Ferris Boyd, those squirrels ran over your legs! As if she and the girl were friends, as if it were fun. Then she'd remind herself, this is not fun. It's like watching grass grow. It was better than counting, though. And for a half hour, Ferris Boyd wasn't the head down, hunched over kid she was everywhere else. Because in school, Ferris Boyd was a disaster. All day long, she drooped over her desk as if her, sad if, as if her sadness weighed so much she couldn't sit up straight. Miss Boyd, Lionel, Lionel Terwilliger would say, please approach the blackboard and complete the problem. So she'd shuffle to the front of the room and slouch by the board. You may commence, he'd prod her. She never did. Finally, Lionel Terwilliger would give up. Thank you, Miss Boyd. You may resume your seat. And she'd slump back to her chair. Without the animals, Ferris Boyd was a barely living lump, like Deli felt all the time now. After school, Deli counted as she washed desks for detention. The numbers walked home with her. They sat in the back of her head, waiting, while she did her homework. Counting is the worst Deli punishment ever. Except for this, Clarice hadn't cried again. Chapter 20 All week, Brad Kinney counted, for, counted the seconds till Sunday. At St. Stanilus, he had a prayer. Please let me see that boy play again, and I won't wreck it. Sunday morning, he'd pedaled slowly down the river road. About a block from the old Hennepin place, he heard it. Thump, 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 clang. He put his hand over his mouth to keep from shouting. All right! At the end of the drive, he peeked around the bush. There was that boy, dribbling and jumping and shooting, just like before. Brud laid his bike in the ditch. He snuck behind bushes till he was halfway down the drive. Don't mess me up again, his head warned the rest of him, because Brud had a plan. He would watch, still and silent, for a little while. I'll learn, then I'll leave, he decided. And at first his body obeyed. While the boy dribbled between his legs and behind his back, Brud's hand stayed still. When the boy ran down the drive, Brud's feet didn't stir. Then the boy took the ball in both hands and jumped. As he floated through the air, he turned to the hoop. He turned so the hoop was behind him. Blind to the basket, he threw the ball up over his head. Brud stopped breathing. It was an impossible shot. The ball didn't know impossible. It soared to the rim and slid through it. And Brud Kinney, Kinney's plan didn't have a prayer. Oh man, he whooped. His arms were pumping the air with happiness. The boy swung around. His scared eyes spotted Brud. Then he was running. Just like before, Brud needed too much, too fast from his mouth. Hey, he hollered. You p play real g, g g The boy was at the stoop. Brud tried again. You play g, g g The boy reached for the door. It was over. Brud hit his mouth with his, with his fist so it hurt. Ah, he cried. His, he hung his head and waited for the door to slam on him and his two basketball loving body. It wasn't the words that stopped Ferris Boyd. It was the g g g sound, the sound of his mouth that the sound of a mouth that wouldn't speak. It turned her around. She saw Brud hit himself. She flinched like she felt it. When the door didn't bang, Brud wondered if he'd been g g g sewing lo so loud he'd missed it. He looked up. There was the boy on the stoop staring at him. Brud took a breath. He pointed to his mouth. H hard, he said. And the boy didn't leave or laugh, so Brud kept on. Y you play real g, 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 and the G got him again. His head went down for good. Brud didn't see Ferris Boyd walk toward him. He didn't see the pad and pen she took from her pocket till they were under his eyes. His face went red. I'm so bad at talking, he thought. The boy thinks I have to write. His hand stayed at his side. The pen and paper disappeared, then came back. Right here was on the page, in pale, skinny letters. They weren't telling, they were asking. So Brud did. You play real good. I play too. I was just watching, he wrote. 
The boy read it and glanced at the ground. Time to go, Brud's head said. His hands wouldn't listen. Want to play a game? It wrote. The boy's eyes got scared again. He looked at the house, then Brud. He was weighing which it would be, and Brud could tell the house was winning. Give it up, Brud's head insisted. Instead, his mouth said, I'm Br Brud. The, boys ga the boy gazed into Brud's eyes like he was reading them too. Brud let, Brud let him. After a long time, the boy took the pad. H-O-R-S-E, he wrote. Your name? Brud asked. The boy shook his head. Oh, the g g game! The boy nodded. No touch, he added in big, dark letters. He held the paper in front of him, like a shield. No t touch, Brud promised. The boy passed in the ball to begin. Brud was so happy, he couldn't keep his mouth from yelling. Yes! Before he took a shot, though, he raised his arm, like he was in school. The boy looked at him. What? What, what what's your name he asked slowly the boy printed ferris boyd brud's right hand waved hi he smiled so the tips of his teeth glowed then they played it was over before brud blinked he got hammered it wasn't that brud didn't make any baskets he did it was because sometimes he missed the boy didn't still even getting skunked brud had the best time ever because he got to watch the boy up close without barreling through bushes. Brud's last shot bounced off the rim and came back to the pavement. He turned to the boy. Uh, g g g again he asked, because he didn't want it to end. But the boy had vanished. Nothing moved around that place except birds and a black cat. So Brud set the ball on the stoop and headed down the drive. Before he left, though, he turned to the house and raised his hand. See you next week. He wasn't telling. He was hoping. In bed that night, Brud was having one of his visions. In his head, he and the boy were playing H-O-R-S-E again, and this time, Brud was winning. Time out, he called, and walked over to the boy. Hey, I was thinking, he said. Maybe you don't like talking either. That's why you have that pad. Maybe you don't have to talk, ever. In his vision, the boy nodded, and Brud smiled so his teeth glimmered. Chapter 21 For Deli... Monday meant no more Alaska, no more detention, no more being stuck in her room. It wasn't Deli liberating, though she was worried. Now I got all kinds of time for trouble. So at recess, she went to Alaska anyway, because it kept her from fun and fighting. After school, she walked home with R.B. Want to skip rocks at the river? He wondered. Nope. Want to make a worm pie? Mm-mm. It was all too fun. Want to watch TV? he asked at the house. No, she sighed, because Galveston would be there, too, with a fight all ready for her. She trudged to her room to keep the peace. And it worked, till Gal found her. You're ungrounded, not on vacation. She snarled. Get downstairs and help us clean. So Deli did. She got the dust cloth and swished it across the tabletops while she counted. That's not dusting, Galveston declared. That's pushing dirt around. Deli kept swishing. Gal got in her face. Get the spray and start over. As she spoke, Gavinson did some spraying of spit on Deli. The spit spattered the numbers aside, so there was nothing between the sisters except Deli's fist. Gal, she growled. What? Just before she hurled her hand into Gavinson's gut, Deli gasped. I gotta go. She ran to her room and slammed the door between her and the fight she was hankering for. Gal followed her. Arby was trailing the two of them, shouting, Deli, count! One, two, she howled. But Gal was banging, screaming the numbers to nowhere. You're not done! Get back there and finish! Deli had her hand on the knob. In a moment, it would be holding a hunk of Gavinson's hair. And Clarice came home early. Hey, she called. Where is everybody? Ma, Arby answered. We're upstairs. What's going on? Nothing, all three replied. Gal, get down here, Clarice summoned her. Deli heard her sister retreat. The battle might be over, but Deli knew the war would go on. She'd need a different plan for Tuesday, or Gal would be bald, and she'd be banished to Trouble Town forever. She fell on her bed, worn out from fighting, from fighting the fight, and wasted from a week of counting. 
After supper, after supper, Clarice came to Deli's room. She sat on the edge of the bed. Deli was so spent she hardly noticed her. One week and no trouble, Clarice said. Huh? She mumbled. Deli, Clarice told her, your dad and I decided that when you have a month of no trouble, you get a Deli day. That woke her up a little. Huh? Whatever you want for a day. Deli never had Clarice or Boomer to herself, except for meetings with police officers and principals. The part of her that remembered happiness wanted to holler, Jiminy Fipes! Instead, she murmured, Hmm. I'm proud of you, Del, Clarice rasped. Deli never heard that before, either. Just like that, those five words filled her up. They inflated her, like a Bodeli balloon. She wasn't tiny or tired anymore. She was blown up to bursting with Clarice's pride. Then there were no numbers, only happiness. She was Clarice's again. Ma, she said, because the word sounded so good. Clarice got up. Good night, Deli. Good night, she replied. She fell asleep with her lips curling up to her eyes. Chapter 22. There was a reason now, a good one, for staying out of trouble. It wasn't the Deli day or to keep her mom from crying. It was being Clarice's pride. Tuesday morning, Deli was still puffed up with it. It woke her with the words, Ma's proud of me. But the numbers were backing up behind her happy thoughts. Ball gram it, she muttered. Then she let them through. Clarice's pie depended on it. The numbers were blown up too. They were flat they were fat and fluorescent colored. They sashayed around her braid, singing one, two, three. Good morning, Ma, she rasped as she came into the kitchen. Good morning, Deli, Clarice smiled. What do you think you are, strutting like you're six feet tall? Galveston hissed. The numbers trumpeted an attack. 97, 98, they blared. Deli high-stepped it to the toaster, and rest of breakfast, and the rest of breakfast would, went without a hitch. It was a long day of counting, though, even with Clarice's pride. By recess, Deli and the digits were tiny and gray again. On Alaska, as birds flapped around Ferris Boyd, Deli thought about after school. It'd be her and Galveston, with only the dinky numbers between them. They'd be, there'd be hand-to-hair combat. Clarice's pride would be crushed. What'll I do, she mumbled. Everywhere else was fun or fights. Then the idea slapped her, like a smack to the brain. Shikes, she explained. It'll be just like sitting on Alaska, Deli told herself. No fun, no fights, and no Galveston. Ferris Boyd, she whispered. I'm following you home. At the end of the day, Deli watched Ferris Boyd slump out of the back door of the school. Then she ran to the front. Go with Gladys, she hollered at Arby. I'll be home later. Arby went pale with worry. You in trouble? Nah, she said. I got a project. What kind of project? Deli told the truth, sort of. It's about birds and squirrels and stuff. I gotta go. But Arby knew her. Those copper curls weren't bouncing because she had a project. They were bound for a deli venture. Hey, he called, but she was gone. What's deli doing? Cletus called. Don't know, Arby replied. He was going to find out, though. All right, well, that will be all the reading that we're going to do today. So we will see you next time for the rest of the chapters.